Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. ICS 515 update. What's new in the course and why detection and response in ICS is more important than ever. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Kai Thompson, Certified SANS Instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to turn the webcast over to Kai. Thank you, Carol. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening to those of you dialing in from the Middle East. If you're doing that on what is your Sunday evening, your own fault. Um, good afternoon to those of you in Europe. Good morning in the US. And if you happen to dial in from Australia, are you crazy on a Saturday morning, Friday night? Yeah, kidding aside, welcome to, to the webcast. Um, I'll give you a quick update of the next 30, 40 minutes of what's new, just now new in our ICS 515 class. With that, yeah, this is me. Um, some of you probably know me. So I used to work at Audi until the end of January. And now I'm where all the cool guys work except me. Um, I'm at Dragos now, Rob Lee's company. Um, lead the international incident response team there. So I happen to be a lucky guy that not only can teach these things for SANS, but also work in the exact field um, that I'm teaching in. Um, just a quick overview of what we currently do at SANS when it comes to ICS. Um, these are all the courses we currently offer. Sometimes I get asked in ICS 515 why there's not more hands-on work with actual ICS equipment. Um, that is because you actually don't really need that in instant response, but we do have a new class for that. Down in the right um, bottom corner, 612. Um, where we actually have you work in lab environments with a lot of um, control units and all of the stuff you will probably like to test and work with. But for now, let's get back to ICS 515 and why instant response is really so important in our industrial control environments. Um, yeah, this is, I hope, not going to be too much of a Dragos advert. Um, please keep throwing stuff at me otherwise, at least virtually. Um, but yeah, we've, we we do this in-year review, we call it. So kind of in the tune to the tune of what um, the Verizon folks do with their data breach investigations report. This is now the third time we're coming out with that. And basically, we look back at what happened in the world of ICS in the previous year. And this comes from our own threat intelligence, our engagements, so pen testing, architecture reviews, incident response, and also the vulnerabilities all guys looked at that were uncovered when it comes to ICS software and also equipment. So this is the current threat landscape. There's a link where you can download that. Highly recommend you look into it. But also, if you find anything else of interest, um, that is published by someone else, please also look at that and just notify me. I'd love to see other stuff put out by other vendors or other organizations in this field because it's still a small field and there's still a lot to learn and a lot more to share for us. So let's look at some key findings of the threat landscape in ICS in the previous year. So top left, corner, let's start there, go through this line by line quickly. So we saw new activity groups, so what we call threat actors, um, acting against ICS environments. So currently we're tracking 11 of these groups, so there's, there's more than the year before. So things are increasing when it comes to threats against ICS environments. We'll get to why that might be in a bit, but for now, let's just say there's more happening. This might have to do with the fact that there's just more people looking for these threats, more organizations starting to have visibility in their environments. But it also certainly has to do with the fact that, yep, this seems to be effective, 
either regard, regardless of whether you're a nation state that wants to make a point tactically or strategically, or you're a criminal organization that wants to earn more money. And again, we'll look at that as well. Um, we do see not only proliferation of threats, but also the threat groups out there expanding their capabilities and their targeting. So what does this mean? For example, one activity group that we saw in 2017, we call it Zenotime, that attacked that refinery in Saudi Arabia. You might have read that. We've seen that over the previous year, not only targeting gas and oil, but also expanding to other industries, chemical industry, electric sector, so and also expanding over the world. So not only Middle East, but APAC and the United States as well. So again, it's not only threat actors that are increasing as teams that do stuff in this environment, but also they're expanding the targeting. So at the end of the day, more targets, more risks for all of us. Third party and supply chain threats are also increasing. Maybe some of you have some experience with that as well. So what we're seeing is especially managed service providers, telecommunications providers, backbone internet service providers getting attacked by these targeted threat groups, activity groups, um, to prepare, for example, man in the middle attacks or to using the trusted access as managed service providers have into their clients' environments for their own nefarious purposes. And this is something we've seen for now at least 10 years, but it's still on the increase. So it seems to be highly effective for the adversaries. So they love to use, of course, what works, and it makes it just harder for us on the defense side to detect these activities. Because again, if it's admins operating in our environments, sorting out what's good and what's bad just might be a little bit more difficult there. Ransomware. Um, I just, today, when I was taking a walk and starting to get my thoughts straight for this webcast and all the other stuff I have to do today, um, I listened to the Risky Biz podcast from last week, so February 20. And Pat and um, his, his team said, like, well, maybe 2020 looks like the year of ransomware in ICS, because it started with a news article about, um, you might have seen that, CISA came out with something, I think end of last week, that there was um, a ransomware incident in the United States at a gas distribution um, site. Actually, that was um, not this year, but sometime last year, and it's already been reported. It's now just a CISA reporting on top of that. But yeah, ransomware in that environment. But what we're also seeing is ransomware that directly targets ICS, so it knows what ICS software looks like and it's able to switch off certain bits and pieces of ICS software. You might want to look for that report. Um, I think we designated that malware as ECANS, so E-K-A-N-S, but there's also some other reporting out in that. And those of you that follow security reporting, you're probably very well familiar with the um, Norsk Hydro case of last year. So long story short, I'd say 2020 is hopefully not the year of ransomware, although it's looking like it's similar to 2019, this early in the year already, but 2019 was definitely the year of the ransomware. If you just think back to what happened um, last year when it comes to ransomware with all the municipalities in the United States and Europe being attacked, all the companies, again, Norsk Hydro and other companies, there were a couple of them in Germany here as well. Um, so this is a lot of stuff. And this means not only that ransomware, when it hits the business environment, can impact ICS. Think of your um, scheduling and planning systems, your ordering systems, all of the large software applications that enable you to run your business. And of course, if you're manufacturing or distributing something, have ties into the ICS environment. But also now, as I mentioned, as we're seeing ransomware that directly targets ICS environments, I don't see a way where this is going to ebb off anytime soon. But also what we're seeing is common tactics such as phishing or password spraying or watering holes or all of these known tactics 
continue to remain popular and very effective. So we're seeing just more of that. And I mean, if you've been about around the block for a while, we've seen this for at least 10 years, if not more. So as defenders, we have to ask ourselves, are we doing enough to be effective in detecting these? And we'll come to that in a bit. But also what we're seeing, and again, this is, this is a continuing story, especially when you look at ICS in the past six or seven years, Adversaries are increasingly targeting remote connectivity, VPNs, and trusted VPN site-to-site -site connections that are stood up for um, outsourcing and um, just peer partners. Think like logistics, where you have to have lots of um, connections to other partners, especially what I used to work in the automotive industry. We have some of the largest and most complicated logistics environments that you can imagine, the just-in-time logistics that help you to build cars. But just-in-time means, yeah, that logistics providers have to ship the goods right to the assembly line just this minute, just now when we're starting to build a certain vehicle. So this, of course, means on the IT side, on the network side, a lot of communication and integration that happens with various managed service providers, third parties, and all of that. So adversaries leveraging these connections is a huge thing and makes detection, again, harder and um, overall more difficult. And also policy-wise, it's kind of hard with just preventive security measures to do a lot of the effective a lot of effective stuff against that. It's just adversaries are leveraging the ways we organize our work environments against ourselves. This is what, from my point of view, the most important takeaway of them leveraging VPNs is. Also, what we've seen, again, you probably follow the news. So last year, think back to the fall of last year, tensions between the United States and Iran and all the things going on in the Middle East. But also, again, Ukraine, Eastern Europe isn't really quiet. It's just dropped out of the mainstream news, but there's still a lot of stuff going on. So as we're seeing escalating geopolitical tensions, there's always a chance that some party might decide that cyber actions against control environments of their adversaries might be worthwhile, and that is exactly what we're seeing. Um, the problem with that is, of course, um, you might remember WannaCry and Apatia and these things, that either intentionally or unintentionally, there is a lot of collateral damage not Petya, if I remember correctly, was one of the largest, if not the largest, financial damage um, events ever we've seen when it comes to incidents in the IT security world. So this is basically an overview of what the key findings are of the threat landscape. So let's look at what we're doing when it comes to defense. And here's the problem. So this is, again, this is from the report we put out. This is looking at what we've encountered when we actually go on engagements, regardless of whether they are more of a preventive nature. So we go into architecture assessments or um, tabletop exercises or do threat hunting or even instant response. So either we help with building up a security operation or we actually come in because the client thinks that they have an incident. 100% of the organizations we looked at had routable network connections into the operational environment. So what does that mean? So regardless of what we think about air-gapped ICS environments or firewalls that completely prevent internet access to our ICS environment, it doesn't really seem to be the case. So I still have to see an environment that is really air-gapped outside nuclear power generation, probably. Um, in some organizations that I've worked with in the past, I've even seen actual routable IP addresses being used inside ICS environments. So it just had to do with the sizes of the environments and 
people responsible for setting up these networks or really knowing how else they could tackle the problems of not having enough IP addresses and probably not wanting to go the NAT way, so no address translation. So we're seeing all of that in so many different environments. So even if you think that your ICS environment is air-gapped, in scare quotes, or doesn't really allow any connection to the internet, please look again, because I'm rather certain that there is some internet connection. If there is, of course, this makes anything the adversary does in your environment just so much easier for them. So more than 70% of organizations have poor security, poor security perimeters, which allowed our red team to traverse and gain access into ICS networks. So again, that ties into the first finding probably. So, and probably some of you already have made those experience in your own environment. The perimeter between the enterprise environment and the ICS environment is porous at least, and it just has to do with the nature of how we run businesses nowadays. So I'm not really looking down on companies that have to do this. This is how, how we run tightly integrated businesses. Again, think just-in-time logistics, things think manufacturing planning environments, or if we add in industrial internet of things, this is just what's happening. So we've said at least 10 years ago in the enterprise IT environments that perimeters are a thing of the past. They're no longer there. And we're just now experiencing the same thing on the ICS side. So this is just something we have to deal with, although segmentation is still a very important um, security architecture building block. When it comes to detection, although we found that more than 70% of organizations could not detect red team activities, if they can't detect red team or pen testing activities, then they probably cannot detect actual adversaries to begin with. So the one thing that, of course, we all should be doing once we stand up detection capabilities is like the lackmus test of doing detection is, can we actually see pen tests being conducted in our environments? If we cannot see those, we have to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's going wrong. Because this is, of course, the most important thing. Number one for your blue team is see all of your red team activities. In more than half of the incident response cases involved, we were involved in adversaries could directly accessing, access the ICS network from the internet. Hmm. Again, if you think back to the previous points, of course, this is kind of logic, right? If, if there's a direct internet access, accessibility from the ICS environment, it's kind of natural that the adversary can go, might be able to go back the other way, although firewalls. But so what might be happening there? So one of the things that we're finding is, of course, and again, I've been seeing this for at least 10, 15 years, Maintenance access, if it doesn't really work with the VPN that you're giving to your integrators, then they find another way. And more often than not, that's the, the LTE modem they're putting right next to um, the segment of the ICS they're responsible for building up. Or it might be faults in configuring the firewalls, or it might be anything else. Also, large environments, if you look at them, think of for how many parts you are really responsible and how many segments of these environments are actually being run by managed service providers or ICS integrators and providers. So again, this is a complex and complicated environment and we need to figure out what is what, but sometimes just due to the size and the way we work with outsourcing and our tasking nowadays makes this hard for an internal defense team to figure out what your area of responsibility is and how to get on top of that. But we need to be better at figuring out what the architecture of our environments looks like and how this is set up. Yeah, and then finally, in none of the incident response cases we were involved in, we could leverage internal log aggregation or any kind of visibility into the ICS networks. So in other words, we still have a long way to go when it comes to doing the basic things in ICS environments that we've 
at least hopefully been doing on the enterprise side for a number of years. And of course, this is centrally aggregating all the logging data from all the computing infrastructure, but also all manufacturing, so industrial control equipment that we have. So all of that, all of these logs are really, really important to figure out what is what and what is going on in the environment without visibility and without seeing what is going on in our environment, we cannot even start to defend our environments. So what's the TLDR of this? Threats and risks increasing. Overall, we're still doing the basics, although I'm fully aware that basics are hard to implement if you don't know how. So this is the whole point, actually, of why we created a class like ICS 515 and T-Shirt at SANS to get around these basics. And I know basics are hard to do. Um, they're also not really sexy. So the problem is that um, it is usually easier to think buying a certain piece of equipment from whatever vendor makes your problems go away might look like the easier route, especially for leadership. But that doesn't really work that way, right? We need well-educated and trained people that know how these environments work that then start creating visibility inside these environments and then can leverage tools to help them do what they have to do to secure our industrial control environments. So let's look at ICS 515, um, what it actually is, for those of you that are not familiar with the class, and then, look, then later on we'll look into how we've extended um, this version of the course that we're just starting to teach in the couple, next couple of weeks. If you look at incident response and the demands on an incident response team um, caused by how modern threats, regardless of whether criminal organizations or nation state um, activities, how they are operating, you see that there is not one team in your IT security department that can do all of that. So what used to be incident response is in the more modern definition of what we do, actually um, separated separation of duty. So it's three or four teams that actually work together during an incident. And um, shameless plug for a book here from a fellow sense instructor, Steve Anson. Um, you, if, if you're looking for a new good incident response book, you might want to look into Applied Incident Response. Just came out a couple of weeks ago. Again, the title is Applied Incident Response. Um, we like it so much that everybody um, on our incident response and hunting teams got a copy recently. Um, and you see actually the same graphic in there as well. So um, Steve, of course, leveraged a lot of what we teach in various science classes, what we know that works. Um, and this is how we teach um, the modern way of active defense and incident response. So this is what we call the active cyber defense cycle. You might be familiar with it. It starts with threat intelligence consumption or generation if you're already a mature organization, but it means knowing about potential adversaries to your organization, but also knowing about your own organization. So looking from the outside, and your organization through an adversary's eyes and mindset to figure out where your weak spots are. So what are the most likely alleys of attack of a potential adversary into your environment? Asset identification and network security monitoring is usually that what most of us do in our socks. So people staring at events. But of course, it all starts with knowing what is inside our environment. So asset identification is really the key point here. And usually when I ask people when I give talks or in class, how many of us are actually have effective coverage in configuration management databases or any other type of assets, identification and um, documentation systems? There's only maybe like a third of the audience that shows up their hands and yeah, we're doing that. So I know it's a hard problem, but we do have to be better at that. Again, it's one of the basics we really have to be good at. We cannot defend what we don't know we have. 
So, but once you combine threat intelligence, so know what to look for and network security monitoring and asset identification, so know how to look for and your how to look for bad things in your environment, you can become really, really effective in spotting the adversary in your environment. And this is where you, of course, automatically go into instant response. So instant response, as we all know, a lot of planning and preparation involved, but then having dedicated teams or task forces working on um, settling a specific incident. This has to be, to be done in a timely matter. So usually, especially in ICS, we don't have enough time to go all old-fashioned and collecting full hard disk data from all the systems that might be affected. If you're dealing with large ICS or enterprise environments, you're dealing with hundreds or thousands of systems. There are certain differences between ICS and enterprise most have to do with the fact that you're actually not supposed to really touch ICS Windows systems um, because if you take them out of commission, bad things happen to the business operation, so the actual plant or manufacturing processes. So again, we teach a lot in class about how to do instant response correctly in ICS environments. Threat and environment manipulation is about learning from the threat, so malware reversing, malware analysis, figuring out weak spots in malware, but also in the environment where the malware was found. So how can we leverage either the environment or some weaknesses in the malware um, to get rid of the threat? So one good example is always first generation water cry, which contained, as probably some of you know, a kill switch. So if you were able to sinkhole a certain DNS request that WannaCry made, the infection stopped. It's usually not that easy to make threats in your environment go away, but understanding how malware operates and then messing with it. So for example, cutting off its communications abilities or making some logical changes in your environment, like firewall rules that you activate, these things actually slow down the adversary and buy your defense team time to come up with a reasonable defense and how to mitigate and then eradicate a threat. So again, this is the active cyber defense cycle. So we, just so we have more specialization and not too much workload on one team, we usually divide this up between four teams that work either internally to the organization or some parts might be outsourced, for example, like threat intelligence or malware reverse engineering. So why is it ACDC? Of course, because it's rocks, right? ACDC. But of course, also, because this is the way it actually works. So I've stood up three teams now that work um, with this method. Um, so I can confidently say, yeah, it works. But it takes people that have some training and then take some specialization and so that know what they're doing. And it takes a lot more communication between those teams and of course, it takes dedicated people that do this on a daily basis. So network detection, threat intelligence is not something you do once a month. This is just something that has to be done on a continuous base, um, basis. Um, and again, the important thing here, and especially when it comes to ICS, is that we quickly figure out what's going on and then come up with the safest way of mitigating a threat in the environment. The main difference between ICS and enterprise IT environments is that usually, I mean, if you shut down SAP in a large enterprise, bad things will happen and a lot of yelling will start. But the environment is not damaged and people are not injured or might even die. If you bring down the integrated safety system of a refinery and you have a fire with explosions, that is something completely different. So again, if you look to incidents like Trisis in Saudi Arabia or some other incidents like those two cases of power getting cut in Ukraine, 2015 and 2016, this is just on a completely different level. And the thing is, again, impact, to a physical environment, especially if it's critical infrastructure, 
is just so much more dangerous than most of the things we can imagine in IT environments. So maintaining safety and reliability of the ICS environments that we operate in is of the utmost importance. So that's the most important difference between instant response in ICS and IT. And again, this is why we set it up this way. This is why I have the separation of duties, and this is why we operate just somewhat different to our peers in a solely IT-based environment. So what do we do in ICS 515? Those of you who are not familiar with the class, in a nutshell. So it's a four day, actually it's a five day class. So day five to get that out of the way quickly is the challenge day. Like in most SANS classes, we have that, have that at the end of the week, right? We have a capstone challenge or a team-based challenge like NetWars, where you get to try out all the things that you learned over the week. So what do we actually do in ICS 515? So we start with day one threat intelligence, which is usually um, the hardest for most of um, you engineers and OT, IT security folks, because threat intelligence, hmm, not that many tools that we actually work with, but crazy out of the box thinking. So when I studied at university way back when, many, many years ago, I studied computer science and humanities, so to me, intelligence is always a revenge of the folks that studied humanities or philosophy, because we ask these crazy, why are things the way they are questions and not how does something work, like engineers do and um, sci um, natural scientists do. So that's what we do in day one, threat intelligence, figuring out how we can leverage that, how we can evaluate the quality of intelligence, and then how we leverage it in our environments. Day two, asset identification and network security monitoring. So I just mentioned that. So um, we teach a couple of methods on how you actually make this problem solvable. So how to divide and conquer and make this actually doable in your environment. Day three is instant response. I mentioned some things about incident response already, so quickly go over that now. And then day four, threat and environment manipulation, which is again just our term for you learn something about basics of reversing malware, interacting with malware or other capabilities of a threat. So it doesn't have to be malware all the time. It just might be the adversary hopping onto your control system, onto your HMI, and then start throwing switches. So like your operators would do, but in a manner that would harm your environment. So we figure out how can we track that? How can we analyze what an adversary is doing? What are their capabilities? And then what can we leverage in our environment to make the threat ineffective by our sales time and then clean up the um, intrusion? So most of this is about verifiable, repeatable methods. So one of the things that I continually go against when it comes to um, teaching or talking about instant response and all of these other things is that it still seems to many folks in the security community as some kind of magic or alchemy, and it's totally not. We want it to be verifiable, repeatable scientific methods that are actually provable to work. Yes, we talk about tools, but believe me, tools are a lot less important than methods. Um, if you've taken a couple of SANS classes, you already know that we usually show you at least two different ways of how to do things because tools, all tools break at some point. So again, it's more about the method than the actual tools. I can't stress that enough. So. Finally, updates, what's new? So those of you that followed S4 conference in Miami in late January, you've probably seen that Maiche, um came out, published the ICS attack matrix. And we also have something in um, the new version of the class that we call collection management framework. So let's quickly dive into what this actually is. So those of you familiar with ICS, uh, with the attack matrix, you've probably seen the enterprise attack matrix, which um, started to become a really big thing last year and also in 2018 already. But most of the buzz around it I've seen, especially in 2019. So most people started picking it actually up. Um, but the enterprise attack matrix 
could really be leveraged for the OT side of your environment. So I really like the enterprise attack matrix. I work with it a lot when it comes to the enterprise side, but it didn't really help us with how adversaries are actually moving and attacking on the ICS side of the environment. So um, now we have something. Um, it was released in January 2020. Lots of the stuff that is contained in the ICS attack matrix comes down to specific techniques that we've seen adversaries using against ICS environments. So again, think like Ukraine 2015 and 2016. Think again, Trisis. Um, so methods and tools that or techniques that adversaries use to actually conduct attacks so operations with the means of harming or disrupting or degrading or destroying ICS capabilities. That's what this is about. So regardless of whether it's enterprise or ICS attack matrix, where does this help me? What does this buy me as a defender? So number one, they're very effective tools to help us build a roadmap for detection capabilities. So you can actually use the, the attack matrix to build your roadmap for what you have to do, be capable of doing when it comes to detection in your environment. That has to do with, again, threat intelligence. Who's the most likely adversary getting after me? So who might be attacking my organization? So look at those groups, see what techniques they've seen, seen using in previous incidents, now you know what techniques you have to be capable of detecting. Now you have your roadmap, what you have to be capable of um, build, or what you have to build up when it comes to detection capabilities in your environment. But there's still something missing there. What do we need? What logs do we need? How much retention do we need? Um, what devices do we pull these, need to pull these logs off? So let's go to the second part here. Oh, first of all, web page. Really important. So those of you interested in the ICS attack metrics, this is a link where you can go to, and Carol mentioned it already. Of course, these slides will be downloadable later. So this is where you can go. These are the techniques you can see. Also, usually what the ICS attack metrics does, if you look at the um, first line here, this, these are the phases of the ICS cyber kill chain. So same as in the enterprise ICS attack metrics, those of you familiar with <clears throat> excuse me, kill chains, you can always, um, if you detect a certain technique, uh, map it against the kill chain so you know how far the adversary is um, with reaching their objectives in your environment. So how quickly you have to spin up your responses and how drastic you have to be in your response measures. So that's a really good thing. Again, to me, analysts should always be working with kill chains of some type but knowing what to detect for what phases of the kill chain is really, really important to figure out for you what detection capabilities you have to come up with. So next portion, collection management frameworks. So what is that? You can read the definition here. So let me, let me walk you through what this is and how we teach it in class. So, if I look at the, the attack matrix again, it's just a, Let's go back here quickly. So as you see a couple of um, techniques. So for example, we see data historian compromise here, or we see exploitation for evasion, or let's, let's look at something here. We see block reporting message or block command message. So we see these different techniques, but what logs do we actually need from what devices to figure out if this technique might be used against us in our environment? So in other words, what data is collected and from where? What data do we need to collect to be able to detect this capability being used? How long is that data stored? So how much, how far can we go back in time to figure out if an attack was going on? And what types of questions can the data answer as it relates to detection and response? So in other words, if I decided for my environment to collect all the data from all the devices, 
then this would not only be a very, very tedious and expensive data collection operation. So even if you're leveraging open source software or something like ElkStack, which doesn't cost you anything when it comes to licensing, it is still a huge cost when it comes to storage of the data. So you're going to need a lot of servers and a lot of um, space to just store the data. But it also comes at a cost to what the analysts can actually deal with. So always when it comes to detection, and you all know that, the problem is false positives and just amount of data that an analyst has to walk through when they're trying to figure out what happened. So the smaller we actually make the data right from the source that we collect, and the more we target what data we actually need to detect certain attack techniques, the more effective we can be in analysis and detection. So we reduce false positives, we, drew, we reduce cognitive burden of our analysts, but also it's a much cheaper operation, right? Because we don't need that much storage, we don't need that much collection points all over the place. We focus on what's most important. Usually you also combine this with what we call crown jewel analysis. So figuring out what the most important segments in our ICS environment are, and again, this is usually what I also teach in class, it is a lot easier in ICS than in an enterprise environment to figure out what is really important. In an enterprise environment, depending on who you ask and what department, you will get like 10 different answers from five people, and it depends on the time of day and um, time of year probably. But in an ICS environment, you just talk to your really experienced um, field engineers and process engineers and ask them, what would you, what should start making funny noises for you to ring the evacuation alarm for this site immediately? Or what should start failing for you to start looking for a new job tomorrow because you don't think that we will be back in operation over the next three months? So actually, it is that easy asking people to find the most important segments in a ICS environment. Of course, then the tedious work starts with figuring out what components are in these segments and how to get data off of them. But this is how you should approach it. And again, collection management frameworks on top of the ICS attack matrix and the other stuff that we look at, like when it comes to detection methods in ICS 515, makes this a much more focused and much more effective approach. So what used to be a discussion of, yeah, the environment is really large, there's no way we can collect all the data, to, okay, we started collecting all the data in our environment, but what is what in that data now, now becomes, I would say, a cookbook, because you have to do a lot of work still. But what we can do is give you some methods on how to go on that journey and how to figure out what is really important in the environment, how to bring it in a structure, and how to know to ask the important questions of the data we can collect, and then how to spin off detection of that data. And that is what I really like about the new class. I think now when it comes to day two, asset identification network security monitoring, we can tell the whole story. Why couldn't we do that in the first place a year ago or two years ago or three years ago? Because the methods weren't there yet. ICS security is still a very young field. We're still developing things as we move along. So this is just as quickly as we come up with something we integrated in class and then figure out if it works, go back, reiterate, and refine this. So actually what you're learning here is the latest and greatest that we came up with and we know that actually works. And leveraging this, frankly, from other fields, so again, looking left and right to different disciplines. So those of you that are familiar with how intelligence works, collection management framework is a methodology that comes from intelligence and has been adapted to work in ICS security and also enterprise security. So I'd love to see people using that, of course, in all kinds of detection, not only in ICS. So, to summarize this, threat intelligence, why is it important? Know yourself and know who your most likely adversaries are. So again, learn to look at your own organization from an adversary's point of view. Find the weak spots when it comes to the outside of your organization, but also know who the most likely adversaries to your organization are. 
good threat intelligence should drive your data collection and detection efforts. So once you know what adversaries and what techniques to look for, that informs your data collection and detection efforts, right? You only collect that data that you need to collect in order to de detect certain techniques and certain adversaries. You focus on the data that is needed. Through that, you're able to collect, retain, and leverage that stuff for analysis and for a lot longer time frames than usually. If you think about when we collect everything, how expensive that is and how not far we can go back in time. Once we do it this way, all of this just becomes a lot more effective. And if you read the next um, Verizon, data, Verizon Data Breach Investigations report, it will probably still tell us that, yeah, most of the incidents are only detected like 200, 300 days in. So being able to go back in time a lot is really important. So again, the more we condense, can condense the data that we're collecting, the better we actually go able to go back in time and figure out what actually happened in our environments. With that, I'm done. This is what's new in class. So again, collection management frameworks, ICS attack matrix just came out in January this year, so brand new, and lots of development still going on there. Hope there's something in it for you. Hope to see some of you at the next ICS 515 class. Do you have questions? All right, thank you so much, Kai, for your great presentation. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment. Maybe we can give people a, a minute or two here to uh, see if they formulate some. In the meantime, I'd like to remind everyone that you can find your CEUs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS, port into your SANS portal account Navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CEU on the right-hand side of the web page. All right, Kai, I'm not uh, seeing anything else come in, so thank you so much for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.